Tēnā koutou katoa, uh, e ngā hau i whā, no mai hara mai ki tēnei uh, o ngā webana tuatahi, uh, o tētahi uh, kaupaparanga hau uh, koutou e mātaki taki ana, mai i o koutou tari, o koutou kāinga, o uh, koutou moinga hoki, uh, tēnei te mihi atu uh, kia koutou katoa. Uh, Anei mātou o te Kotahi Research Institute, e noho ana nei i te tari o te rau matatini, uh, tēnei te mihi nui, uh, te mihi matakui kui kia koutou katoa. Uh, ko Naomi Simmons tēnei, he uri nō raukaua ki te kaukau rō o pā te tere, uh, nō reira uh, tēnei te mihi nui kia koutou. Um, thank you everyone for joining us from uh, the Four Winds, from wherever you may be, your office, your, um, your, your home, your bed perhaps. Um, we're really excited about the first um, of our webinar series um, hosted here with Te Kotahi Research Institute, but also in partnership with Te Rau Matatini. Um, so our first, this is the first in a series of four uh, webinars, uh, and today we have Associate Professor Leonie Pihama, who will be talking to us about kaupapa Māori theory. Um, but before we get into that, we just wanted to uh, remind you all that if you haven't registered, um, if you look in the description box uh, down below, there'll be a link for registration, um, and we'd encourage you to register so we know uh, who we're talking to and who's joining us from where and um, what your interest is. Uh, interests and mahi is. Um, so click on the link below and register if you haven't. And we also just want to acknowledge uh, our sponsors for this webinar series, uh, Te Rau Matatini, who I've mentioned before, Ako Aotearoa and the Health Research Council uh, Ngā Pai Fellowship as well. So just a mahi um, and shout out to them for their support of this uh, webinar kaupapa. Um, and yeah, we're really excited. This is new um, and a technology for us, um, so we're really excited to be here supported with Te Rau Matatini and look forward to um, our presentation by Associate Professor Leone Pihama and also the discussion uh, that will follow. So there are opportunities for you to ask questions um, in the feed, YouTube feed below and we'll be able to uh, engage with those uh, in some discussion uh, after Leone's presentation. So thanks everyone for joining in and I'll hand it over to Associate Professor uh, Leone Pihama. Uh, uh, no mai whakatau mai ki tēnei o ngā wānanga a uh, uh, ipurangi nei a uh, tēnā koutou. So, um, yeah, I just want to follow on uh, initially from um, Naomi's introduction and, and really acknowledge uh, Naomi for joining uh, Te Kotahi in this uh, first webinar around Kaupapa Māori theory and just kind of give a little bit of a context um, as the first webinar to the development of this particular series. Um, so uh, Naomi has talked about those who are hosting and who have uh, sponsored the webinar um, series generally, and that Te Kotahi is doing this in collaboration with Ngā Pai o Te Maramatanga, and particularly with uh, Mai Te Kupenga. So in terms of the webinar series, but also we have three face-to-face uh, -face wānanga or gatherings that we're doing. Um, we've really worked with Ngā Pai o Te Maramatanga, uh, particularly with Tracy and Jacinta uh, Ruru, to um, provide this uh, series for, um, particularly for the Mai Network, the Māori and Indigenous Doctoral uh, Scholarship, uh, Doctoral um, Scholars Network, but more broadly than that into um, the community. So we're really thankful and grateful for those who have who have joined the webinar today and who will join uh, the three that are yet to come. Um, having said that, it's uh, an interesting process for us to be in a room with cameras and not in a room with you um, in person. And so I guess it's a first kind of opening comment around what Kaupapa Māori is and can be. Um, generally, we would do this kanohi ki te kanohi, we would generally do this in a face-to-face -face way um, and build relationships in that way. And so 
um, having Te Reo Matatini provide this webinar service for us to, to, to reach a more expensive network, um, both in terms of Aotearoa locally and nationally, but also uh, internationally, um, you know, really has enabled us to kind of have this talk with, with all of you um, in ways that we may not have been able to uh, previously. So we really do firstly acknowledge uh, all of you that are tuned in, um, your mountains, your rivers, your lands, your language, your cultures, your relationships, um, your activism, your commitment to communities, uh, and the ways in which um, you all as participants engage in kaupapa Māori or in Indigenous theory or in radical change theory, whatever that may be, um, in your life, so we really want to acknowledge that. <coughs> I also need to um, just note that I, I've had the flu for a week, and so you kind of need to bear a little bit with me uh, in terms of the presentation. So why Kaupapa Māori theory? Um, Kaupapa Māori theory is work that uh, any of us have been doing uh, particularly in the education framework through Kaupapa Māori Education uh, for over 30 years. And so it's really important to acknowledge that Kaupapa Māori theory itself really has grown from an understanding that comes not necessarily from uh, only from a contemporary sense, but has come from understandings of our tūpuna, uh, of our ancestors. And that you know, often doing theory for Māori is seen to be a contradiction in terms, and often for Indigenous people generally, theory is viewed as something that's very disconnected uh, from community that is um, located within a Western framework, that is an ivory tower uh, activity or obsession or preoccupation uh, for many. And so I think it's really important initially to think about why we would do theory in the first place. Why is theory important to us as Māori people, as Indigenous people, as scholars, as researchers? And, you know, that's really grounded uh, for me in the notion that our tūpuna have always had to think and have always thought very deeply and reflectively about our world, have always sought to explain and understand uh, our world and the events happening within our world and have always been very analytical uh, and uh, in the process of doing that. I think if we look at things like wānanga, the idea of wānanga and the way in which we reflect on particular issues, the way in which we reflect uh, very deeply on particular concepts or ideas or activities or our world around us, we see that our tupuna uh, have been theorising the world uh, for many, many, many generations. So the, the action of theorising and the idea of theory is not, uh, in my view, something that is um, owned or only in the domain of the Western Academy. And so if we think about theory as a way of explaining and understanding our world, analysing our world from our place, from our space, from our land, um, from where we're from, then it becomes a clearer way of thinking about what Kaupapa Māori theory um, might be. So one of the things is really, if we think around, and we would normally do this as a kind of activity uh, in terms of a workshop place, but I really want you to think about this and maybe write it down as an activity to do if we thought about what was the first thing that your ancestors theorised? What was, what was an event or what was a way of being or what was a concept that you can think about would have been an, uh, a process that your ancestors were theorised about the world? So if we take, for example, in, um, in the separation of Rangi and Papa, so in the separation of Earth, Mo Earth Mother and, and Sky Father, and then prior to that separation, the first slither of light that those children, that those between Rangi and Papa, those deities, those atua, um, 
that when they first saw us, that first shard of light coming through, and they knew that there was another way of being that was different to how they lived. How do you how do we think they thought about that? How do we think they sought to understand that or explain that? Um, what kind of things did they do to try and analyze that? Those kind of activities uh, that require a theorizing or an explanation of a world or of a place or, or of an activity or of an event. Um, so really thinking about those things quite deeply in an ancestral way, in a tupuna way, um, to think about ways in which our generations and generations really of ancestors would have applied and utilised theory, not only for their own understanding of the world as it was, but for an understanding of the world uh, for future Generation. So I kind of just wanted to really begin with that place that Kaupapa Māori theory is not new. It is not uh, only of a contemporary or modern time, uh, but it's very grounded in those ancestral understandings. It's very grounded in a deep reflection of concepts and language and culture. Um, and because we're talking about a particular Māori development, we are talking about a theory that is very, uh, you, you know, distinctive and located here in Aotearoa, and I'll talk a little bit about that more, because it's actually really important that we that we see the specificness of our land, of our whenua, of our seas, of our oceans, of our uh, riverways, of our lakes, of our mountains, that we see that all of the ways of being that are particular to us are what shape our understandings of the world and therefore what shape the way in which we might explain or understand the world. So I kind of wanted to start with that place and um, for those of you who have participated in the workshops that we've done, uh, you'll be familiar with that kind of opening. So I want to move to a um, slide uh, around the need to design tools. So this is from Cathy Irwin, and for those of you who are aware of Cathy Irwin's work in Māori education for many, many years, Cathy, um, very early on in the 90s, began to push some boundaries alongside the likes of Linda Smith and Graham Smith around the need for us to define our own tools within the academy uh, as scholars, as Indigenous scholars. And one of the uh, things that she was very articulate and expressive in was the fact that we can do, um, we can develop these tools ourselves. We don't need to continue to use the tools of others as a way of understanding our world all coming to terms with the kinds of issues that we're coming to terms with. And so this particular slide really for me is around our assertion of our own sovereignty, our assertion of our ability to be self-determining, that the real power in terms of uh, the tools is uh, lies with those that develop the tools. And um, it has a similar kind of resonance to Audre Lorde's positioning around the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Uh, so, you know, it's around moving from a reliance of the master's tools uh, in our context to the development of our own tools, to the development of ways of being and theory where we come to uh, explain and analyse and understand uh, our context from our own place. And that really is a central, this, that particular slide from Cathy and developing the tools is really central, I think, to understanding the importance of maintaining um, both the Kaupapa Māori analysis as we have, but also developing and evolving a range of Indigenous theoretical frameworks uh, that are more conducive to the kind of work uh, that we want to do as Indigenous peoples um, across the world and here in Aotearoa uh, as Māori. Um, it also aligns to the kind of assertion that 
developed in the uh, publication around native studies and theory by Audra Simpson and Andrea Smith, which really articulated quite strongly the need to develop theories, indigenous theories that would align to a very political grounding within native studies. And so I think, although Kaupapa Māori theory has developed primarily out of an educational context, it now, uh, you know, over the 30 year period, has been picked up across a range of disciplines and has been um, evolved and developed in ways that are conducive to particular disciplinary uh, issues and contexts and concepts. And so I think that um, in line with a broader indigenous move around the development of theory, Kaupapa Māori theory now 30 years on is really aligning to that broader indigenous theoretical development. One of the things that I know that we do uh, have um, and that we have had in a type of a Māori theory development from the very beginning is the notion of being very grounded in being Māori. Um, so I want to move to a range of slides which align more uh, to my own identity uh, as a Māori woman. So, uh, no Taranaki Aho. So, this is uh, Taranaki. This is uh, uh, the mountain to which I link directly. Um, and in developing any form of Indigenous theoretical framework, in my view, we need to be very strongly grounded in our own identity and in who we are and where we come from. Because if we're arguing that our frameworks come from our place, come from our whenua, are grounded in our own land, are connected to who we are and our identity, then actually we as scholars and researchers and people need to be deeply connected also to those places and to those communities. That's what changes uh, this kind of theoretical development from the ivory tower kind of uh, obsession in the academy. Uh, where theory is constructed as being um, almost antithetical but definitely separated or dislocated from a community. So in order to, in my view, to really articulate a strong Kaupapa Māori theoretical framework in terms of developing that work, you know, we need to be very grounded in who we are. What I'm talking about here, it's not necessarily about those people who may seek to utilise the framework for understanding. I'm talking about those of us who are working to develop and articulate and control the definitions and the meanings of what Kaupapa Māori is. If we are the ones that are seeking to develop our theoretical frameworks, then in my view, to do that, to maintain a sense of vangatiratanga, a sense of Māori control, we have to be very grounded in who we are. So that means ensuring that we ourselves work to connect ourselves to our own people and within our own communities. So this is the way to the river, the side, and it is uh, where um, I have been, I was born and raised and I am deeply uh, committed to this particular part of Aotearoa. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, and, you know, the history of this particular area um, in terms of the confiscation through the Crown uh, in the 1800s continues to be a major issue for that community, for the Waitala community. So as an academic working in Kaupapa Māori theory, it's really important to be connected for me to where I'm from. Uh, and this particular river, and this particular area of confiscated land <coughs> excuse me, deeply uh, embeds the way in which I understand the relationship between the Crown uh, and Māori. So this slide is uh, the way to the beach. So this is where I was born and raised. Uh, by the Moana, and it provides a strong grounding in terms of <coughs> excuse me, in terms of how I see things, such as water rights, in terms of how I see the connectedness 
uh, to Tangaroa, to Hinemona, to our land, to our coast. And this is the way to the river. So you can see that where I'm from, we're a mountain people, we're a coastal people, we're a river people. And it's really significant for me in terms of how I see myself in relation to the hapu and the iwi of this particular part of devil. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> this is Tikaro Maui at uh, Orway at uh, Manukorihi. Um, and as a fuddy, this fuddy has been uh, a particular house of Manaki for many uh, within Aotearoa. It's a fuddy that was built uh, through a relationship with other iwi in terms of its ability to be a carved house in the Taranaki region. <coughs> it's a funny that has had many activist uh, gatherings. It's a funny that has held many of the uh, discussions that are relative to the land uh, that has been taken uh, within the Taranaki region. And like many funny, it holds stories of our people and the histories of our people. So when I talk about being connected and grounded and being Māori in terms of kaupapa Māori theory and developing kaupapa Māori theoretical frameworks, it is about taking for granted all of these things that connect us that link us and that enable our identity to be fully uh, connected to the land. So this particular slide, <coughs> excuse me, um, from Graham Smith, talks about building on the kind of foundations that we need uh, for Kaupapa Māori theory and that they are grounded within language, knowledge, and culture. And that a part of what a theoretical framework does, an indigenous theoretical framework does, is that it grows from those experiences and from those connectedness, <coughs> excuse me, and from the identity that is that comes from the land. So when we look at a range of uh, indigenous theories and indigenous authors, what we see is a consistent view that our connections, our relationships, our histories, our whakapapa, our language, our culture must all come to play in any theoretical development that we do. So what Graham argues for, and has argued for for 30 years, is the idea of the validity and legitimacy of Māori language, knowledge and culture. <coughs> so, the foundation of uh, Kaupapa Māori is very much grounded in being on Papatūanaku. It's very much grounded in being here in Aotearoa as a distinctive framework uh, that enables us to talk about the issues for Māori, the issues as Indigenous people, um, in ways that are deeply embedded in our ancestral knowledge and in the kinds of ancestral memories that come from the land itself. So this particular slide around <coughs> foundations is talking about uh, really that Kaupapa Māori theory is, is deeply embedded in this land. It is deeply entrenched as a part of who we are as Māori through Papa Tūnuku. So when we talk about Papa Tūnuku as the earth, as earth mother, we're talking about a particular part of the world 
We're talking about a particular cultural relationship with this world, and we're talking about a series of obligations and accountabilities and responsibilities that come with living uh, on this land. And that resonates across a whole range of indigenous sites. This is not necessarily something that is only to do with being Māori, uh, but <clears throat> when we're talking specifically to uh, a kaupapa Māori theory framework, we're talking particularly, <coughs> excuse me, particularly about the relationship that we have with Papa Tonuku and that we have a, a history and a whakapapa relationship, an ancestral relationship that requires us to think in particular ways when we're talking about our own land. <coughs> so I want to just go through a few general ideas um, that relate to uh, kaupapa Māori theory. So one is, um, which is really what the last slide was about. So kaupapa Māori theory in itself is distinctive to Aotearoa. So one of the things around the two kaupapa Māori theory is that we never sought to hide or to um, or to act as though this theory is not deeply embedded in being Māori. I mean, it's one, what I see with Indigenous theorising is often we name our theory very clearly and in doing so, we highlight the subjectivity of it, we highlight the cultural connectedness of it and we highlight the way in which we have um, created theoretical frameworks that are distinctively bound by our cultural ways of being. So what that does is it does call into question a whole range of other theories that hide their cultural underpinnings. So most Western theory will hide its cultural underpinnings. So when we hear of feminist theory, we don't often hear feminists say, I'm doing white feminist theory, or I'm doing uh, you will hear a radical feminist theory, but we still don't hear a cultural framework on which it's grounded. So what we do with an Indigenous theorising is that we're very clear about the cultural uh, and the identity kind of basis upon which our theoretical framework is grounded. So kind of my theory is distinctive to Aotearoa, but it has relationships to other Indigenous nations. And so when we're thinking about the relationship of kaupapa Māori theory and the work we do here in Aotearoa in relation to other Indigenous nations, we're doing it in the same way that we think about our whanaungatanga or our general relationship to those nations. So language theory here <coughs> can be useful uh, in application and other uh, developments of other language acquisition um, efforts from other Indigenous nations, but only to the point that it is useful to that particular nation. Only to the point to which those nations determine the usefulness or the applicability. It is not for kaupapa Māori theory to make any assumption about its applicability to any other nation. That comes through the relationships that we build with each other. And therefore, it's our relations that will tell us whether this is useful and what parts are useful. In the same way that we use a whole range of theoretical developments, a whole range of activist developments from Turtle Island, from Hawaii, from Aboriginal Australia, we use what is applicable and what relates and what is uh, able to be walk as a friend with us or as a relation with us here in Aotearoa. So, for example, um, the development of Idle No More as an activist development in Turtle Island was immediately seen by many of our activists as being directly relatable to us. And so, that framework of activism, we were able to see how, one, we could support uh, that movement, 
but also two, how that movement supported the kind of activist aspirations that we have here in Aotearoa. So the thing around the relationships, I think, with other Indigenous nations is really important when we're thinking about theory and when we're thinking about how uh, we utilise other Indigenous theories, but also how kaupapa Māori theory can be utilised. Developed from a foundation of tikanga reo and mātauranga Māori. So in many uh, contexts, we take that for granted. But I think one of the things around how we think about kaupapa Māori uh, theory in particular around te reo is that we have a need to have a commitment to an understanding of te reo Māori. And so <clears throat> in that commitment to an understanding, to a validation, to a legitimation, to a learning of te reo Māori, is also an understanding that it is colonisation that removed our knowledge of te reo Māori from us. And therefore, to assume that to only be Māori, to be Māori, you must be fluent in Te Reo Māori. It's an assumption that I think marginalises many of our own. So, within a type of my theory framework, there is always the expectation of a commitment to language. There is also an expectation of a knowledge uh, that within your life, that within our lives, we need to be expanding our understanding of Te Reo Māori. Um, not only for this generation, but intergenerationally. So there is a total commitment to Te Reo Māori, uh, <clears throat> and that the deeper knowledge that we have and understanding Te Reo Māori, the deeper knowledge we have and understanding what kaupapa Māori really is. Uh, so I would really um, advocate strongly for all of us to be enhancing our commitment to Te Reo Māori in particular, uh, and through Te Reo advancing and progressing more of our knowledge around tikanga Māori and mātauranga Māori. The third point is uh, about being defined and controlled by Māori. Now, this is a really critical point because this really goes to a rangatiratanga principle that Graham talks about that I'll talk about in a minute. But, you know, if we don't define and control what kaupapa Māori theory is, uh, then when we're giving away our ability to be self-determining in this space. And actually, in order to have a deep commitment to the development of these things, as I said before, we have to have a deep commitment to who we are and where we're from. So over, you know, 200 years, uh, in this country, education has been defined and, and controlled by our colonial, by the colonial forces, our colonisers. And in that process, our deal, our tikanga, our knowledge has been marginalised. And within the academy, Western theory has dominated much of our existence uh, as scholars and researchers, and continues to in many disciplines. So we still have many disciplines uh, and many non Māori academics that continue to marginalise a kind of a Māori approach, uh, in both within the discipline, within the theoretical de development, still within research method methodologies. So for many uh, of our people and Indigenous nations, generally the articulation and the fighting or struggle for Indigenous theory continues within our own context. Uh, and, you know, we still hear many stories from Indigenous scholars, from Māori scholars, from Māori students, scholars, researchers, uh, that when they speak to a kaupapa of Māori theory, they continue to be marginalised in their discipline, or in their department, or in their faculty. Um, and that, for me, is an indication that we still have a lot of work to do around both defining and controlling the space. Within wānanga, uh, within the three wānanga, we can see that kaupapa Māori theory has flourished, that kaupapa Māori approaches have flourished because those spaces are determined by Māori. 
and within certain faculties we'll have seen it flourish. <coughs> but we've also seen an increasing number of non Māori academics assumed to enter into the space in terms of defining what is kaupapa māori. Um, and really the short messages to those, uh, particularly Pākehā academics, this is not your space, you don't get to define this. Western Academy has had 200 years of defining spaces within which we are located as an Indigenous people, and uh, this space is not yours to define. It doesn't mean you can't be an ally, and it doesn't mean that you can't utilise the framework as a tool of analysis. It just means you don't get to define what it looks like or control what it looks like. So even though that uh, underpinning um, assertion by Māori has been made for many, many years, I think it's one that really continues to need a reassertion. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about kaupapa Māori being organic, being of papa tūnuku, being uh, something that grows from the place and the space within which we're located, and uh, that also you know comes from the the notion of the the Gramscian notion of an organic intellectual, that the strongest intellect and the strongest. Uh, theoretical frameworks and analysis grows from within communities and that we as scholars are a part of our communities uh, and so there are a range of organic contexts for kaupapa Māori theory um, in particular in the early development through the activism of the 70s, Ngāta Matoa, Te Reo Māori Society, uh, the various occupations that were very organic and developed uh, within communities, but also within uh, the Māori Education Initiatives, like Kuhanga Reo, like the Kaupapa of Māori, uh, Whanikura, uh, Wānanga, and then into other spaces as each of the different sectors began to develop their own approaches. So the organic nature, nature is critical because without an organic nature, it won't be transformative. So Mel Hooks talks about theory as liberatory, and in, in talking about that, one of the things that she's very, she very clearly states is that theory is only liberatory if you make it or you intend or you require it to be that. And so it's the same with Kaupapa Māori theory. Kaupapa Māori theory will be transformative as long as we require it to be, as long as it is an intention that we have, as long as we expect it to be political in nature. And I'll, I'll come up in the, the points by Graham in a, in a moment around Nangatiritana, but the transformative nature of Kaupapa Māori is embedded in the Rangatiratanga principle and the principle of um, Māori sovereignty and the principle of being self-determining as a people, but also an understanding that the context that we're currently in and that many of our people will find ourselves in, in terms of poverty, in terms of homelessness, in terms of the ongoing struggle for the return of our land, uh, in terms of the theft of our waters and for sale offshore. There's, you know, there is just an ongoing uh, issue. There are ongoing issues of colonialism that we continue every day to face. And so, any and all kind of my theory must have an intention of being transformative. Uh, in terms of talking about type of Māori theory as multiple, something that is really aligns to the notion that the framework that we talk about, that I'm going to talk about today, the overarching umbrella, is, is exactly that. It's an overarching theoretical framework, but it's not the only type of Māori. And, um, and we've been saying this for a very long time. Uh, the way and the principles that Graham Smith in particular has identified provides us a touchstone for, a, for an overarching theoretical framework. But it's not the only type of Māori theory. And so we need to be developing a whole range of theories that align to the kind of work that we're doing that are grounded in the fundamental principles 
that we're going to talk about today, but are not limited or restricted uh, in terms of their applicability or in terms of the specifics of new theory. So when we talk about being multiple, it's multiple in the same way that we have many iwi, that we have many tribal nations, and within the iwi we have many hapu. So we have many ways of being within Aotearoa now that are not only about being Māori, but they are about being from Taranaki, they are about being from Rotoa, they are about being from Kaununu, they are about being all of these places. And so if we have these many ways of identity, identifying with our own whenua, with our own place, then it, you know, it makes sense that we would have many ways of talking about what kaupapa Māori theory might look like, or creating different forms of theory uh, that we can utilise from our own place. Um, <clears throat> and that's really important in the, um, in the notion that you know, more recently I've heard more uh, more people say things like uh, it doesn't change, you know, it's still the same, still the same as it was 30 years ago. And I think that in that space is an assumption that there's only one theory that has to keep changing, mm -hmm. rather than we need to be growing these other thousands of theoretical frameworks that we have that are connected to our place, that are connected to our hapu, that are connected to our iwi. Um, because Marxist theory is 200 years old. I don't hear people saying we need to rewrite it now and make it different. You know, well, what I hear is a whole range of different articulations of it and new theoretical frameworks. So you'll have more Indigenous takes on Marx, you'll have more feminist takes on Marx. Um, and that's just one example, not advocating a Marxist theory, I'm just saying that's an example of a theory that's been around for a long time. I'm not sure how much um, strong articulation we've had uh, in Te Mali, but it's definitely something when we look at colonisation that's applicable to the way in which capitalism came here. But I think this whole kind of view that we have to, the whole view that theory just changes over time, I think is a flawed one. I think the view is, is that we need to be reassessing and reflecting and, and recreating uh, a whole range of theoretical frameworks. If the West can have 50,000 theoretical frameworks, why do we think we have to have one? You know, it doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So, you know, my thing, you know, really strongly advocate for us to think deeply about where we're from, our own hapu context, our own language context, um, and thinking about developing those theoretical frameworks that resonate with where we're from and, and where people are located in our own distinctive Indigenous, uh, you know, understanding of where we're, we're from. Um, the next point is that both being structural and cultural, this comes up in Graham's principles anyway, so I'll just quickly jump on that, uh, past that one. Uh, the, but just to say that Kaupapa Māori theory expects both things to happen, to be both a strong cultural analysis but also a structural analysis. Um, and I'll come back to that. Um, and finally, informed by positionality. Uh, and this is something that Graham's been talking more about recently, by recently I mean in the last 10 years, um, around positionality. So where do we position ourselves? Because that will locate uh, the way in which we approach Kaupapa Māori theory. Um, our positionality is really important um, to the way in which we will apply a particular theory, the way in which we locate ourselves. And so uh, it goes back to, to the uh, initial discussion around uh, where we're from and being Māori is that we have to position ourselves in a particular way. Um, so in terms of the those particular discussions um, and points, uh, Graham has more recently uh, published the, the book of readings, uh, the Kaupapa Māori book of readings, which is available, I understand, um, 
on the um, wherever the link is to this webinar. <laughs> there should be a connect, uh, some way of connecting to the reader. Um, but within that, uh, you know, Graham really just revisits the six earlier principles around, um, you know, kind of what Māori being a very, being a Māori defined and organically developed intervention strategy that is transformative. And when he looks at the culturalist and the structuralist levels in terms of education, he gives some examples around it being about both in terms of what is happening within education for Māori, but also in the wider in the wider context. So understanding the economics and the ideology and the power of a particular uh, reform or a particular way of being is really uh, important in that cultural and structuralist understanding. Um, within a Māori educational context, Kaipapa Māori theory really was, for example, a way of responding both to the failure of schooling, a particular kind of state schooling, where Māori underachievement was, was located as a, as a Māori issue rather than as a schooling or a state issue. And so when you apply a structural and cultural relationship or understanding, uh, it is about moving away from the deficit views of Māori to a much deeper relationship and understanding of power. So I was saying a little bit earlier around, you know, being self-determining in the relationship of Rangatiratana, and that, this is what this particular uh, point is about. It's about moving the discourse from a very colonial uh, serving deficit frame around what is wrong with our people to a framework that is about the power relationships inherent structurally, the way in which they are embedded um, within systems, in this particular context within schooling, and how that serves a dominant group. Uh, so his fourth point was around critical theory. And I want to talk a little bit about the relationship to critical theory. Uh, and that is that critical theory as a framework is one that challenges, takes a very radical challenge to uh, issues of injustice and inequality. Um, <coughs> and that the connection of that with Kaupapa Māori theory is really important because uh, critical theory is, seeks to be transforming of unequal power relationships. So Kaupapa Māori, through the Ngatiratanga, or the expression of our ability uh, and our sovereignty as Indigenous nations, connects with that critique of injustice. But I do want to make it very clear that Kaupapa Māori is not grounded on critical theory. Kaupapa Māori and critical theory align in that seeking of dealing to inequality and injustice and transforming the way in which colonialism operates. However, Kaupapa Māori theory is grounded in being Māori and in having Māori approaches to things. Uh, Graham's uh, fifth point on, on that slide was is around the way in which Kaupapa Māori has become uh, more transferable and translatable across a range of contexts. Uh, from education into justice, into health, into uh, a whole range of um, contexts as a critique. And so, in doing so, it enables us to have a broader picture of the structural impediments that are happening in Aotearoa uh, that are not necessarily educational. Uh, so, <clears throat> and just want to jump to his final point in that particular uh, article, which is the need to critique, the need to actively critique uh, in a way where Kaupapa Māori is a contributor to resistance, contributes to transformation, uh, and is a part of what Graham would talk about as praxis. So the theory and practice and reflection relationship uh, is important and is what will, I think, enable us to develop a range of other theoretical frameworks from this particular, uh, you know, from the 
from the umbrella principles that we have. Uh, so if we're thinking really carefully about the context within which we're working um, and the kinds of resistance and transformation that needs to happen, I think from that organically will grow a whole range of new Māori and Indigenous series. Um, <clears throat> so in his framework, uh, initially from the 80s, so uh, the out of education, Graham talked about six principles. I just want to, many people are very familiar with these. Uh, in terms of te ovanga that is, uh, he would talk about collective autonomy principle, but it, also, it aligns to sovereignty. It is about our assertion of being sovereign. Uh, as you know, as Māori, as Indigenous people. Taumata Kuiho in terms of cultural aspirations, and when we look at Taumata Kuiho, that really embodies uh, language, culture, ways of being, ancestral practices, protocols, ceremonies, all of those things that have been handed down to us from our tūpuna. So you can see these are very broad principles that enable us to operate and to work a whole range of ways of thinking uh, and being Māori uh, into the kind of theoretical analysis that we need to have. Ako, uh, in terms of culturally preferred pedagogy, the ways in which learning and teaching happens, the ways in which intergenerational uh, learning and teaching happens is really critical. Uh, and in the context from which these principles were developed uh, in Māori education, um, that really shows the ways in which we need to think about how we want to pass on knowledge to the next generations. Kapikaki and Ngāvaru Rarui Te Kainga is something that Graham talked about as a mediation of socio-economic factors. I think this has probably uh, really come to the fore, particularly in these past 20 years in terms of issues of poverty and issues of homelessness. So one of the things that we do as whānau, and it connects to the next principle, as whānau, one of the things that we do to help mediate poverty for each other, one of the things that we do to help mediate issues for other whānau members, uh, and that help to support people through hard times. Uh, and so this really is a principle that's about, if we're talking about kainga, as in papa kainga, as in collective ways of living. Uh, and we can think about that conceptually even if we don't live in a communal space. But if we're thinking about that conceptually, what are the things that we are willing to do as Māori? What are the things that we are willing to do as Fano to support those Fano who are enduring dif uh, difficulty? So I think a really prime example of this uh, in practice is Te Puya Marae. I think Te Pui Marae is one example of a collective response to a collective issue. Uh, and so what this does is it gives us a framework to think about how are we going to, how can we turn some of these issues around that our own whānau are experiencing or our own community are experiencing, that we know the Crown or the government or the state have no intention of intervening in any meaningful way. Um, and that comes to the next two principles, really, which is whānau and kaupapa. What is the role of whānau? What is the role? And so Graham talks about this as an extended family principle, but often within an urban context or within a uh, schooling context in kura kaupapa Māori, those whānau you may not be directly related to, but they are your whānau. They are the people that live with you. They are the people that help school you and educate your children. They are the people you learn language with. They are the people you eat with. They are the people in an urban community or in a, a particular context. So it's both whakapapa uh, in terms of whānau, those direct relations that we have, but kaupapa in terms of whānau, those people that we joined together with through a collective vision. So when we look at those six principles, you know, those are enduring as principles. Uh, and it might be a conversation we have a little bit later on. So in my own work um, many years ago, in my own PhD, I added a number of 
uh, particular conversations that were relative to those principles, which are kind of like sub uh, discussions under those principles. One was something more particular to Te Reo Māori and Tikanga. So we know that Taonga Tukuiho is inclusive of Te Reo and Tikanga. Um, in the discussion that I had around mana wahimi as a theoretical framework, I wanted to speak particularly to Te Reo and Tikanga and the impact of colonisation on those things. So we have to be constantly vigilant around the way in which colonialism impacts on our language and impacts on our culture and the way in which we um, operate as Māori. Uh, and so those often we need to think particularly about te reo and tikanga within a particular context and speak to those. Mana Motuhaki, uh, which clearly aligns to te wanga tiratanga, but in my, for me, uh, really talks about a state prior to the treaty because the term te wanga tiratanga came through te tiriti o waitani. Prior to that, as Indigenous people, we had a whole range of other ways of speaking about mana, about mana motuhaki. And so it is a reminder of our Indigenousness is not always, and it's not solely tied to te tiriti o waitani, but actually also precedes that. Um, te Tiriti o Waitangi itself in terms of our treaty relationships and they talk to the structural uh, and cultural connect. Uh, many issues I think that we're continually to deal, continuing to deal with uh, are grounded in a breach of the treaty uh, and therefore requires a, a <clears throat> requires a particular discussion of the relationship of a particular kaupapa uh, to those treaty relationships. Whakapapa, uh, again, connected to whānau. Um, but when we're speaking often to Māori women's issues and to mana wahine, uh, we have to very, uh, you know, we, again, we have to be very cognizant of the way in which whakapapa is talked about, the way in which particular whakapapa lines may be privileged over others, the way in which Māori women are located in those kind of conversations. Uh, and, you know, and ensure that the, the whakababa conversation we're having is relevant to the particular context within which we're located. And then decolonisation as a process, um, which really aligns to that critical intent uh, of being strongly politically grounded about transformation and about reminding ourselves not necessarily to believe everything we read, uh, particularly from ethnographers that come with a colonial intention uh, and, you know, to be, uh, to have a de decolonising process as a part of how we come to understand the ways in which we're presented with information about ourselves by others uh, and what we need to do with and to that uh, in terms of thinking about it in a contemporary context. So the decolonisation uh, discussion is a very broad discussion, um, but I really wanted to emphasise in terms of Kaupapa Māori uh, theory that that critical intent requires us to be actively engaged in decolonising. Uh, and actually, I want to leave it there, I think. Hey, Yeah. Good boy. I'm Kana Leone. Thank you for that. It's, um, it's always really interesting listening to your corridor um, and also hearing the articulation of Kaupapa Māori Awaha um, it's, it's, um, as a reader of most of the Kaupapa Māori literature it's really useful I think to, to hear um, that being unpacked um, through this through this webinar um, so just want to uh, mahi to you um, for your work and for your um, sharing with us. Um, I know there will be lots of you uh, like me who have taken lots of learnings from, from that corridor, um, which I think is inherent in the, in the whole concept of Kaupapa Māori, that we position ourselves as, as learners um, always, and that's inherent in the principle of Apo. Um, but I think if we're thinking about theory and, and kind of theoretical development, um, we are continually learning from our surroundings and from our, our place in the world and from our connectedness with others. So. Thank, thank you for that. Um, we now 
um, have an opportunity to have some discussion. So we're going to um, look at some of the stuff that's coming through on a live feed, some of your kōrero. Um, but I just wanted to touch on a few things in Leone's kōrero, um, I guess as, uh, as a lead into some of the discussion that's, uh, that's coming. And there were kind of three, I guess, things that stood out for me um, in your kōrero around kaupapa Māori theory. And so the first one was around um, not just the organic development of kaupapa Māori, but also how our theories in the multiple, so kaupapa Māori and the others, underneath grow from our whenua mm. and from our tile. Mm. And one of the things I'm really interested in kind of thinking through a little bit more is how that happens, not just metaphorically, but literally. So in terms of the work and the connectedness to activist work for protecting the whenua, it's not just about protecting the tile, it's about protecting the kind of um, theoretical um, thinking that comes from our engagement relationship with those places without mm. our place in the world. So I'm really interested in that kind of part of um, of, of your kōrero and thinking about the local specificity of Kaupapa Māori but also its global relevance mm. um, where that is kind of called, uh, called for across um, lots of our whanaunga around the world. Um, the other part of your kōrero I'm really interested in is this notion of kind of um, critical thinking and critique and um, kind of unpacking and using decolonization to uncover these these assumptions of power. Um, I know in a lot of my classes, a lot of uh, students struggle with this idea of kind of critical writing and critical reflection and, anal and analysis mm. in terms of trying to think about where that sits in a kind of kaupapa of a Māori uh, space. Um, and so my thinking around that is, you know, it's, it's not just critique, or critical thinking for critical thinking's sake, but it's mm. very much tied to all those principles that mm. you shared, um, yours and, and Graham's um, as well. And it's tied to that um, looking at power and interventions in terms of transformation. Um, so really, yeah, really interested in kind of engaging um, engaging with that in terms of those, those decolonial critiques and critical analysis as well. And then I think one of the kind of really key things in the in your kōrero and in Kaupapa Māori is that connectedness um, across mm. a whole range of different spaces. So that connectedness, and I think stands out really strongly between activism, mm. research, between what's happening in our communities, between the politi you know, the kind of political level, um, but that connectedness between us here in Aotearoa, um, between hapu, iwi, but also um, beyond our shores and how we connect to others um, using kaupapa Māori or within a kind of kaupapa Māori mm. framework. So that's kind of just a few of my reflections, and but I think it's time now that we um, engage with our audience um, from afar. So we've got lots of mihi coming through <laughs> from around the world. So kia ora everybody, thank you for that. Um, I'm just trying to see whether there are any pātai. There is a pātai, sorry, not, my eyes are... Uh, so this part I um, has come through from Picky Diamond, um, who is wondering people's thoughts on the role of Modi or where Modi resides in the principles of mm. Kaupapa Māori theory. Mm. Question. Yeah, that's um, we have a similar one around Mailua too. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So we have another question that came through via email. Uh, so this question is, what do we understand to be the role, influence, implications, effects of wairua in kaupapa Māori research? Mm. So I think, I mean, there are a number of things. Um, one is that both Modi and wairua are inherently a part of who we are mm. as Māori. Mm. So I think when we're talking about principles around, uh, if we talk the general principle of tāngo tuku iho, and, and as I said, you know, that's a very overarching principle. And so the way in which we may see um, that principle can vary depending on the context or the kaupapa at hand, so the issue at hand. But just, you know, both my, Modi and Waidua, you know, are inherently a part of who we are as Māori. And so they will always come to play in any kind of analysis and relationship that we have in terms of each other, but also in terms of a theoretical framework. And so there are a number of people that write in terms of both Modi and Wairua, um, 
I mean, a lot of money Rose Petty's work in particular comes to to mind in terms of the interaction of both of those things within Apple and who Tefiki and Apple, you know, have always constantly spoken to both Modi and Waiva. Uh, Mason Drury's models are consistently uh, relative to um, both Modi Order um, and and Waiva. Um, Meta Pinheader's work around Modi Order uh, more recently again talks about models of theory and frameworks and, and understandings that are relative to a notion of Modi order. Um, so I think that really it's, um, as that's one of the things around when you speak to principles, principles about um, <coughs> a particular framework is that you can't dig down into those in the way that you may want to. Um, and, you know, this particular webinar we would do, you know, in a, um, to the three-day workshop. So um, I, you know, I do appreciate both of those part of it because they do remind us about the particular tikanga that we need to think about when we're looking at something like Taung Chikungu um, and the way in which we utilise those tikanga and our understandings. I think that we we often are more careful about how we might write about Wainua and a theoretical framework. Um, and I think that's because of the kind of protectiveness that we probably still need to maintain around some of those understandings of our tupuna, those spiritual understandings that really sometimes are only for a whānau or only for a hapu or only for an iwi and not necessarily for a general discussion or consumption. Um, and so what I would say is that that's a part of developing the frameworks, that, the multiple frameworks that they need to develop, is thinking about how do we, in a particular context, as a, you know, from a particular place, talk about Modi and Wairua, because again, both Modi and Wairua are connected to place, are connected to, to our land, our whenua, are connected to, to the spaces that we're in. Uh, and so we need to be doing those for ourselves. Uh, as Vano and Hapu and Iwi, I think that they do need to be uh, thought through collectively uh, because they have a collective relationship um, to the particular groups uh, of that particular land. And I guess once we start to really come down to things like if we were thinking about well, in Tikanga, if we were thinking about going to a particular marae, you know, that is of a, uh, a hapu that has their own particular kawa, we, you know, we align to that kawa. And so we have things like tikanga, a iwi, a hapu, a whānau, and kawa, a marae, that already tell us there are many ways of doing things. And actually, I think that's really exciting. That's, that's because if we applied that to Kopapa Māori theory, we wouldn't have a, you know, we wouldn't be concerned that, we, that we're developing with it. Every Fano has its own theory, every Marae has its own theory, every Hapu has many theories, every Awa has its own Awa theories. Uh, and that's not even to count the many uh, ways in which they connect with other Awa. So we have theories of relationships. Uh, in terms of where our awa might join or meet, or the source from which they may come, from where your mountain might have travelled from and its original source, you still have a relationship to that place. So, you know, it's kind of, we can go off on many tangents. It's actually, this is what I love about a couple of money theory now. Um, I think too the role of, you know, when I think about Waito and Modi and, and, you know, what you mm -hmm. see as one of the for me, one of the most powerful parts of being Māori is are those things, mm. those intangible things that, yeah. again, don't always translate in an academic context mm. when we're talking about that, but Kaupapa Māori has created the space um, in terms of theoretical space and academic context for us to actually have these conversations yeah. and understand the implications. Yeah. But I also remember reading, um, I think Linda uh, Smith had written about, you know, that, that, it, that it's, it's those intangible, those the way to work, that often can be a really strong form of resistance against what I think she called the spiritually impoverished Western mm. theories. Mm. You know, mm. these Western theories that really uh, detach themselves from any sense of 
of the intangible mm-hmm. and actually try to actively kind of bleed that out of, of their theoretical frameworks by yeah. considering these kind of neutral objective yeah. um, kind of instances. And I think that's where in your quarter or you know your discussion around um, the role of Kopa Māori in, in actually explicitly claiming our, our um, kind of cultural underpinnings um, rather than uh, assuming as many if not all Western theories do this kind of normalization and therefore invisibilization of their power and their control and mm-hmm. that really stands out for me in Kopa Māori is that you know a lot of it in a sense is calling out Mm-hmm. Those, in terms of the, the critique and kind of critical theories, calling out the normalization and invisibilization of those other cultural mm-hmm. underpinnings mm-hmm. as the as the norm and as, as yeah. insidious normalization in many <laughs> in many cases. Well, yeah, I think that the academy itself, the whole notion of a Western academy, uh, is spiritually impoverished. I find mm-hmm. quite you know enjoyable to some degree. Um, you, you know, because I think that's a good description. Uh, of what happens when you, uh, and I think, you know, through that kind of enlightenment process of the West and its theory, you know, really worked hard to separate itself from anything that was to do with spiritual weight or uh, anything that could not be kind of reduced to some kind of uh, formulaic way of measuring itself, um, which is what the whole notion of objectivity comes out of. And the obsession with objectivity and uh, you, you know, that theory must be objective and that research must be objective and that we have no subjectivity in our space. And and I think that is a part of separation of the spirit as well. Um, and of Modi, which is, you know, that, that deep essence of who we are, that part of what makes us, you know, living. And so it's not just a human notion of Modi, it's a... Uh, it's something that exists in all things. Um, so, I mean, I do think that the the, the way in which, uh, you know, universities, and I want to talk specifically to Western universities because the indigenous components of, uh, such as Wānanga and other um, indigenous developments in the kind of tertiary sector, you know, don't do this, but the Western universities' assumption that, um, that it can remove spirit or spiritual discussions is really grounded in that reductionist view, that kind of positive, positivist view of theory. And so, you know, we don't have to abide by that. We don't have to abide by that. Even in the university system, even in the Western disciplinary system, you know, the whole way in which disciplines have been created and theory has emerged from particular disciplines it's really um, make believe in itself. It's um, it's been constructed to merely, you know, um, reproduce the same ways in which Western thinking has compartmentalized everything, separate from each other, and not in relationship, not connected to each other. And what Kaupapa Māori theory has always done is said very clearly: we are Māori, and this comes from a Māori place. We are about kaupapa, so we are about collective vision. We are about collective ways of approaching uh, uh, how we think about the world. Um, the notion of kau kite papa, you know, so kau to hold firm and papa in relation to foundation, and the and the concept of kaupapa itself makes it foundational, and that its foundation is this place. Is our table. So everything about Kopapa Māori theory is about asserting our indigenousness, it's about asserting our sovereignty, it's about being self determining, it's about our connectedness. And we see indigenous uh, people across the world doing this in their work. Um, and we have much more to draw on in terms of developing those relationships with other indigenous theories and theorists, you know, people that are using their language and culture and protocols and ceremony as a basis for thinking about the world and understanding and critiquing colonialism. So, um, we, you yeah, know, we've got a lot of work to do in terms of the developing uh, of those theories. Um, and which, which leads in, uh, Leone, too, we've got oh. another part which le- right. leads very nicely into that 
um, into that party. Uh, so Jenny Lee Morgan, Tina Kui, Tokana, um, has a party. What do you think is the greatest challenge to the development of Kopapa Māori in our current context? So if we're thinking moving into the into the future and now, what? well, I think there are a number of challenges um, that are equally great. I think one is a continued uh, Western obsession with its uh, own dominance. So I think that within the academy we continue to be struggling with disciplines that deny indigenous knowledge, that deny language, that deny culture, that deny the fact that they're built on our land. Um, and so, and many are built on stolen land. Uh, in terms of universities here in Aotearoa. So I think that there is that. It's the, the, I think we have this kind of assumption amongst many people who are working in Kaupapa Māori that, you know, we're very, uh, you know, it's very accepted in terms of Aotearoa. But actually my experience in the past 30 years is that we are still continually having to fight uh, and struggle to ensure that Kaupapa Māori uh, Cup of Māori generally, Cup of Māori theory in the academic scholarly sense um, holds the space that we've created. So I think that's one challenge, and it's always going to be a challenge because the reality is why would colonisers want to enable Indigenous theory? It doesn't benefit them. Uh, and so in that colonial process, what we're often calling on is our other Indigenous relations and those allies who align uh, with seeing Aotearoa as Aotearoa and not New Zealand uh, to walk, continue to walk the struggle with us. So I think we still continue to have to deal with um, those fundamental colonial structural processes that deny our language and our culture. And you know, when we look at um, schooling in particular, the fact that the Ministry of Education can continue to deny the teaching of, of Māori history from a whānau hapu iwi understanding in our schools is something that we should be all reeling against uh, because it just continues to maintain histories about this land that, that, that um, affirm the colonial process and the assumption that um, the schooling on this land fits all, and we know it doesn't. Uh, so I think that that's one. I think, um, and I think within ourselves, for ourselves, it's really around as Māori uh, really affirming that we can do this, that we can do this, and uh, that we can do it very powerfully and that we can affirm each other. We don't all have to be the same. You can be doing it as whānau, as hapu, as iwi. Uh, and that we have a fundamental right as the people of this land to be utilising and drawing on our language and culture and processes and protocols and ceremonies as a way of understanding our world. So it's a two-pronged thing, I think. Okay. So we're, we're heading towards the last um, five minutes, I think, of our, um, of our webinar. Um, and just, I guess, in my role as uh, discussant to try and, I guess, pull together um, some of this amazing cordial, I wanted to really, was really excited, Leonie, when you said our theories. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this idea that actually our whenua, our waters, hold theories mm -hmm. um, within themselves for us. And I think, the, the notion that Kaupapa Māori, that these this multiplicity of theories grows from the land and flows in the rivers and, you know, sits at the top and bottom of our maunga um, is something that's re really exciting in terms of thinking about Kaupapa Māori, both in terms of its development, but also in terms of, uh, historically, but also in terms of its kind of relevance and development um, moving forward. So I'm really excited about that because I think the thing that that does is that it, that, uh, can become the catalyst for that intervention and for that um, commitment to our communities but also to our whenua because I think when we remember that, when we remember that Kaupapa Māori comes mm. from this land and the waters and we reconnect with that, then that transforms 
our um, obligations. It transforms our world and the way that we engage with that. And so that that kind of relationship to activism and relationship to kind of political interventions and social interventions and restoring the health of our people and our our and land and our pile is really important. I think um, personally that's something I take really strongly from from this quarter and from the, the from Kopapa Māori as a theory. And I think the, the thing about that as well is it extends it beyond the boundaries of what a theory is usually is, is the academy, the ivory towers, the Western institutes. And it stretches us beyond that. It stretches us out to our fishermen, to our you know fisher fisher men and women, our to our navigators, to you know to the people who are you know they, they can theorise about that because they know those places intimately. They they live, they breathe, they work on those places on our hour um, as well. So I think for me that's it's a really um, kind of strong thing that that resonates. Um, in this corridor, um, as well as as our obligation to think of how we kind of continue to intervene, how we continue to critique, um, how we kind of push uh, decolonisation as an agenda um, and our imperative to do so across a whole range of different spaces, um, and really to call out those things that continue to invisibilise us and to um, assert their own power, assumptions of power um, and real power as well. So I just want to mahi to you, Leone, again, for your um, time. I know that you're not um, 100% uh, well, so thank you for sharing that with us, um, with all of us from wherever us is um, located currently. Um, and just want to, um, again, thank everybody for dialing in, is that what you say on a webinar? <laughs> for dialing in or logging in. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to the next series of, of webinar as they come through. Um, and just we'll finish by saying uh, another mahi to our um, sponsors, sponsors and partners. So Te Rau Matatini, Ako Aotearoa Health Research Council Ngā Pai Fellowship, Ngā Pai Oti Maramatanga. Um, tēnei te mahi nui, kia koutou katoa, uh, kia rakoutou. Kia rakoutou. Kia rakoutou.